Today is January 9th, 2022, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Michael Henry Adams. Michael is a Harlem-based activist, architectural, cultural historian, historic preservationist, author, lecturer, and much, much more. Uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show today, Michael, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, the main fun. issue... Uh, the main the main issue I wanted to talk to you about today is the latest attack by real estate developers on the Harlem community. Can you tell us about the development project in Harlem referred to as 145? Well, 145 is particularly egregious because um, it is so enormous. It is bigger than anything that's ever been built in Harlem. And uh, it's so big, you think to yourself, how would someone have the audacity to do this? But you see, one figures they imagined that they had a trump card that would um, that would open all doors. Mm -hmm. um, there, I'm mixing my metaphors, but uh, mm -hmm. but they they. Uh, um, uh, apparently approached the Reverend Al Sharpton, whose headquarters is in a building that will be demolished for this new tower, these pair, this pair of towers. And uh, uh, so they're saying to him, oh, we're going to create wonderful new headquarters for you. So that will appeal to him. And then the thing which Sharpton undoubtedly found irresistible uh, in terms of lending his support to this project is that they said, we are going to create the um, Civil Rights Museum, the New York Civil Rights Museum, which you have long wanted to create. And we will create that uh, um, as our um, gift to the community. And uh, so from my perspective, in my testimony at the community board, I said, you know, this is um, a fig leaf that is uh, meant to do a lot. It's meant to be a fig leaf for two enormous erections that are bigger than any structures that are anywhere near it, or even any structures that are in Harlem, period. And uh, it cannot be allowed to happen just because it's too big. And secondly, because in order to create the assemblage to build this structure, which needs a, which is so big that it needs a zoning variance, um, even though it ha they have a, a large footprint to build it on. Um, in order to create that footprint, they um, demolished the Hotel Olga. And why did they bother demolishing it? Because they knew that um, there's something called the National Historic Preservation Act. And that um, if you have a building which is potentially eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and you're getting federal money for a project, then you have to devise some kind of mitigation. Well, uh, the Hotel Olga was a little three-story building um, which was built in the early 1900s as the West End Hotel. And that was, you know, the early 1900s, Harlem was still um, almost exclusively white. But by 1906, more and more African-Americans were moving to Harlem from um, the Tenderloin and Hell's Kitchen and San Juan Hill and even farther afield um, with the Second World War, I'm, I'm sorry, with the First World War. With the First World War, as uh, the owners of factories in New York went to the South to recruit black laborers because whites were being drafted. And initially, President Woodrow Wilson refused to draft um, African-Americans because he said they, that black people would not fight. So uh, there was this irony that you had 
African-American leaders like Booker T. Washington and Madam C.J. Walker actually going to Washington to meet with the president and the secretary of war to plead to have blacks be allowed to fight in the war so we could show that we were worthy of being full and free citizens too. Um, well, at just about that time, as the close of the war, um, because even as Harlem became more and more a black dominated community in terms of demographics, the leading businesses, including the leading hotels, refused to um, allow African Americans to patronize them. And that meant that the Hotel Teresa, which was completed in 1913, um, had a strictly whites only policy. So, and so did virtually every other hotel in Harlem. And so um, the brother-in-law of Alilia Walker, a man named Wilson, he decided to buy the West End Hotel and to make it into the most um, commodious and elegant, well-appointed um, place that African-Americans could stay in Harlem. And it gained that reputation and it continued to be that place, the best place in Harlem where blacks were able to stay until 1937, when after Joe Lewis won the heavyweight champion of the world, he was allowed to stay at the Teresa and ultimately they opened up to African-American patrons. Uh, so, you know, um, Louis Armstrong and, um, and uh, Alain Leroy Locke, the um, African-American philosopher who founded the philosophy department at Howard University and who had been a Rhodes Scholar and was the first and for uh, about uh, 70 years, the only African-American Rhodes Scholar. And uh, all sorts of African-American luminaries who came to Harlem stayed at the Olga. And um, Nancy Kennard, the uh, white heiress who um, had an American mother and an English father, she came to Harlem after she compiled her anthology of, um, of African-American life that she called Negro. And she came to Harlem with her black lover and because she had first been staying with him at an hotel downtown and got all kinds of uh, um, snide remarks and ill treatment. So she left her hotel downtown and came uptown to stay at the Olga. And so, a highly historic place. Um, at the community board, the issue was raised that the Olga was destroyed for this project. And the developer said, oh, well, you know, the Olga was, uh, had been vacant for many years and it was in terrible condition. Now, this is the kind of thing as a preservationist that just makes you want to pull your hair out. Because when buildings are blamed for their own demise, you ask the question, well, who allowed it to get this way? Who allowed this to happen? You did. So mm -hmm. um, they think that we're fools. They knew it was highly important and highly historic, but they let it be demolished by neglect and then tore it down in advance of proposing this um, unseemly project. And I'm so gratified that Community Board 9 um, unanimously voted against the project and that um, local activists took to the streets to demonstrate against this project. You know, they're so brave because, you know, I'm very, as, um, as officially a senior citizen for the past year, I, I'm afraid of the COVID. And so I would have been reluctant to go out marching. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm so gratified that somebody did because this is important. And what is the worst thing about this project? 
the worst thing about this project is that if it is allowed to go forward, it will set a precedent and you will find comparable towers ungainly in their height, transforming Harlem from the place where Langston Hughes extolled Harlem saying, and Harlem, you can see the sky. Well, that won't last for long if buildings like this are allowed to be built. And tell us why, you know, development, taller buildings um, is, is, is potentially bad. Well, of course, in New York, we need more affordable housing. And uh, this building officially is supposed to have some affordable housing. I think there's supposed to be um, uh, something like 30% um, of the apartments are supposed to be affordable. But affordability is calculated using the median income for the um, local area. So you would think that would mean Harlem, but it doesn't. It is an area um, that is so large that it encompasses Westchester County. And as a consequence, um, you know, the um, most affordable apartments in this building um, would go to people who have an income of $50,000 or greater. So, of course, um, these days in New York, $50,000 is not what it used to be. But in Harlem, the median income still hovers somewhere around uh, uh, $40,000. And as a consequence, you can't say that um, an apartment that you have to earn $10,000 more than the median, the local median, that that's affordable. And of course, in Harlem, there are all these new apartments, um, these market rate apartments, which compared to apartments that are downtown, you know, New York is a city where there are apartments that cost $200 million. So Harlem doesn't have any of those, but we do have apartments that are selling for three and four and five and six and seven and eight and $9 million. And uh, yet the median income is uh, around $40,000. So you can't have apartments where that's the baseline um, when people um, in the aggregate make $10,000 less. And when that's only 30% of the people who will move there, and when 70% of the people who move there will invariably be white. Why do I say that? I say that because when you get to the upper ranges of what apartments cost, when you get to a $500,000 apartment or a million dollar apartment, most African-Americans who have that much money to spend for housing would prefer to get more bang for their buck in communities like New Rochelle or Mount Vernon or Teaneck or someplace where they can get so much more than in terms of space and in terms of a yard and, and uh, something closer to the uh, uh, kind of Hollywood vision of the American dream than a little two bedroom apartment in Harlem. So, um, the black white wealth gap is such that uh, whites on average have 10 times more wealth than African Americans. And as a consequence, since white people have more money, what has been borne out as the pattern all over Harlem is that more white people buy apartments here than black people. And uh, 
What that means is that inevitably, when you've got 70% versus 30%, Black people will be outnumbered, will be pushed out. And uh, when you consider um, the housing projects near this building and the other um, existing affordable housing that's near this building and the incomes of the people who live in those places, uh, the um, cost of these accommodations will only put pressure on affordable places to become unaffordable because once uh, landlords realize that they can get more money, they will try to do it. And before you know it, they'll be um, attempting to get rid of people so that they can uh, um, do work to uh, um, justify being able to raise the rents and getting more money. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that aggressive displacement campaign of trying to push uh, you know, long-term residential rent-stabilized tenants out of Harlem's is already ongoing, and this project will only augment it. Well, the thing that's so horrible is that there is a trend of young people of color, along with other people, to espouse um, a um, notion that has been given to them directly from the Real Estate Board of New York, the, the, you know, the um, organ of the um, real estate industry in New York. And that is they suggest that landmarking is bad because, as, because it is elitist and racist. And they say it's elitist because it means that you have these smaller buildings, which if they were demolished could be replaced by larger buildings that would have some component of affordable housing. But what these crazy people don't appreciate is if you look at the rent controlled apartments in your typical um, six story, uh, um, 60 unit um, pre-war apartment um, with rent controlled units, that affordability is many times by a great magnitude more affordable than these new apartments that they're calling affordable. And therefore, there are plans afoot to get rid of buildings on Broadway and elsewhere in Harlem um, that are existing solid um, sound buildings from a hundred years ago and more buildings that should be landmarked because of their history and because of their architecture that aren't protected. And uh, people want to either demolish them or to build um, unsightly additions onto them that will include market rate housing. And we've got to come to grips with the reality that New York cannot grow infinitely if we, we have more than enough housing for the rich, if we would simply concentrate on creating the requisite amount of housing required of the poor and even the middle class, then we would be doing a great thing. But no, the idea of the developers and of the government is to bring more and more and more rich people here and their idea is that the expanding tax base will underwrite everything else. But what they're doing is making the city unlivable for the poor and the rich alike. Mm. And it, it, it's just nutty. You, ju you just can't understand how someone would take New York and its glorious history and just trash it. For what? To, to kill the goose that laid the golden egg, you know, like, Right now, there's this plan for a new Penn Station, and uh, they're planning to tear down landmarks like 
um, St. Mary's Anglican Church and, and uh, um, the Hotel Pennsylvania by McKimmead and White. I mean, imagine a building that's intact architecturally, that has this history where, um, you know, the Dorsey band played there and originated the song uh, um, uh, where one of the lyrics is the phone number of the Hotel Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, uh, um, what is it, 64, eight, 5,000? I mean, people remember that who don't even remember what their childhood telephone number was or their hmm. current telephone number for that matter. Hmm. And these things are important um, milestones of history and they are being leveled for no good reason. So for instance, with this Penn Station deal, they are not going to make Penn Station any bigger. It's not going to be able to serve more people or anything. It's going to be the same size. So why are they doing this? They're doing this to create more big box stores and more super tall buildings. And I hate to say this because it makes me seem very wicked to say such a thing, but uh, but it's an inevitability. It's not something that I'm wishing. But sooner or later, in one of these super tall buildings, there will be a fire. Mm. And they won't be able to get those people out. Mm. And it's going to be, it, it, it's, you just can't believe that people would do things which um, are so wrongheaded. Mm. Uh, and, and which not only will not achieve what they want to achieve, but actually will have negative unintended consequences. Mm. Absolutely. You know, they, speaking of which there was, I don't know if you heard about it in the news, uh, but a few hours ago, there was, there was a big fire in the Bronx in, in one of these tall buildings. And so far they have found at least 19 people have, have passed. Um, yeah. So it's- That's it's all... really terrible. So imagine if the building is a hundred stories high. Mm -hmm. how much more difficult it would be to get to them or for them to get out of the building. It, it's, it, it's just folly. It's the kind of arrogance that, you know, accompanied the um, launching of the Titanic mm. where the technology was by no means foolproof. Um, and they just imagined that everything wouldn't go wrong, but everything did go wrong. Mm -hmm. And what, what then? So what do you do when you have one of these buildings and everything goes wrong? Everything that you did had counted had counted on to go right, all goes wrong. You you've got a bunch of dead people, and a tragedy of uh, of gargantuan proportions. Mm -hmm. I want to um, read the a full a, a fuller quote um, that from what you gave in the hearing. I know you you mentioned a part of the quote, but I have a fuller quote that you gave at at the hearing related to this project, and it says. And you said, um, this is an appalling thing where a civil rights museum is being used as a fig leaf to camouflage two obscene large residential towers that are bigger than anything anywhere around them. And I think that that begs the question of all this displacement of, of the existing black community that, that will, that already is occurring and it will inevitably occur as a result of this, this project who is gonna? Who is this museum for, right? You know, is this, who is this museum intended for? But who is gonna be going to this museum? You're gonna have the the community that is displaced come back and say, "Oh, this is where black people used to live." You know, but like, what is this civil rights museum really going to be for? And and similarly, the Urban League is built as a, is supposedly building a museum on 125th Street uh, with the same kind of idea of you know we're, we're putting in these these putting in Whole Foods, we're putting in Trader Joe's, we're putting in The Gap and all these other stores, but we're gonna give you a, a civil rights museum for who? For the gentrifiers to see that this is what, you know, Harlem once was. You know, it's, it's, it's really perverse and, and disturbing. The Urban League building, the Studio Museum building, and this building. Another aspect which is reprehensible about all three of them is that in the past, beginning way back around 100 years ago, around the time of the First World War, 
Holomites um, imagined that our black population was substantial enough that if things were built in Harlem, that architects who lived in Harlem should have the opportunity to design them and build them. And not one of these buildings is um, being designed by a Harlem architect. And the Studio Museum building, you know, people would say, oh, well, he's a, the most famous black architect in the world. It's David Adjay, Sir David Adjay. But he's not even an American citizen. He's a, a, a British citizen. And uh, for, so far as I'm concerned, an honorary white person. I mean, it, it's shameful that local people who are amply qualified should not be able to get these commissions. And the, or at the Urban League building, their, their, their fig leaf is they're saying, well, the, our interior designer is a black interior designer from Chicago. It's shameful, it's awful. Uh, the Studio Museum building um, is reprehensible furthermore because it's tearing down, they, they've torn down an authentic piece of old Harlem, a building built um, at the end of the 19th century and designed by um, prominent New York architectural firm, uh, um, Oh, what is the name of that firm? It's, um, um, oh, good grief. Well, I'd better, clearly I'd better skip that. Um, a prominent New York architectural firm. And it wasn't a great building, but it just was part of the real genuine 19th century fabric of Harlem that Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston would have known. And now, it's being replaced by a building that looks like nothing else in Harlem. And yet, Mr. Ajay has written all of this stuff, endless stuff about how it's meant to be reminiscent of the stoops of New York. The um, Urban League building further um, displaced local, um, merchants who rented stores in um, the garage complex, which um, existed there earlier. And that, it's very interesting because that garage complex with those storefronts on the Avenue on 125th Street, that was a community benefit negotiated by the National Urban League so that there would be um, subsidized, affordable commercial space for local merchants um, and um, when that garage was built um, preparatory to the um, Harlem State Office building being built and the uh, um, uh, African Board of Trade, which was supposed to be built on the corner of Lenox and 125th Street. Uh, this was a community benefit that uh, provided um, space that was supposed to make up for all of the shops um, that were held by local merchants that used to be um, on 125th Street, on the north side of 125th Street between uh, 7th Avenue and Lenox Avenue. Uh, and so this was supposed to be, you know, a symbolic um, apology for the elimination and displacement of all of those local stores. And now they have eliminated those stores. They're going to have new commercial space as well as this uh, so-called uh, Civil Rights Museum. But of course, the merchants aren't invited to come back at the rent they're paying now. Mm -hmm. They're says they invited to come back to pay market rate. Well, if they couldn't afford market rate before, why why would they be able to afford market rate now? It's just mm -hmm. so it, it, the Urban League building, all all of these new things, which 
some people think are part of a neo Harlem Renaissance of the new Harlem Renaissance. Hmm. No, it's the new Harlem demise so far as black people are concerned. Uh, when I wrote in the New York Times, my um, op-ed story called uh, The End of Black Harlem, uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who was then the head of the um, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, he didn't address my piece specifically, but he did write some little piece somewhere, I, I forget where it appeared, but I remember reading it and he said something to the effect of, uh, yes, gentrification was a problem in Harlem, but that thanks to institutions like the Schomburg and the Studio Museum and the National Black Theater um, and the Apollo Theater, that Harlem would still remain Harlem. Mm -hmm. And David Dinkins, when he was interviewed by New York for New York Magazine, he said something similar. He said, you know, yes, the high prices of new apartments are terrible, but um, don't worry, Harlem will still remain. How? How? If the majority of the Black people who live here are forced out to have to live someplace else where they can afford to live, how will Harlem remain Harlem any more than Paris would remain Paris if you got rid of all of the Parisians? Or hmm. Venice would remain Venice without um, the Venetians. It's just unfathomable, mm -hmm. this reasoning. And uh, uh, the um, worrisome thing is that, you know, we can see this happening all over the country in New Orleans, mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and Oakland, California. Mm -hmm on the south side of Chicago and south central Los Angeles along West Adams Boulevard. Unreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time, I thought, well, you know, how can you control where people move and live? You know, people should be able to live wherever they want to live. But the, of course, thing that I overlooked when I used to say that is that African Americans by and large cannot live wherever we want to live. Either we're priced out or worse, we are simply denied and redlined the same way we were before the Fair Housing Act was passed. And they've done all these studies where they've shown, you know, that if you send an African American to try to buy a property, that they will not be able to get financing and that some white person with um, fewer qualifications to get a loan will then be given a loan for the same property. So, uh, and, and, and then of course, once President Obama won the first time, I realized something very important. I thought, my goodness, were it not for all these urban areas with these high concentrations of African-Americans, Obama might not have won. And if being concentrated in ghettos was done to um, keep white people from having to encounter us, then surely it should be something that we can do for ourselves in order to be able to have meaningful political participation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, when the Supreme Court gutted the um, Voting Rights Act, New York City was one of those places that was not allowed to change their voting uh, laws without getting permission from the federal government because of all of the political shenanigans that had gone on to segregate people and to segregate voters and to determine predetermine the outcome of elections. So I just pray that 
President Biden and the um, Congress will be able to persevere, amend the filibuster and pass the um, John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. because otherwise we are um, going to be in bad shape, not just in Harlem, but across the nation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and, and speaking about uh, the 145 development project, what are the next kind of procedural steps in the approval process for this project? Well, it next goes to our new Manhattan Borough President, Mark Levine. He has said in the past, you know, that he's um, opposed to gentrification. Our um, new mayor has said that he's against gentrification. Uh, will either of these gentlemen see this building as contributing to gentrification? Or will they be persuaded by Al Sharpton and others that um, what with this new museum and 30% so-called affordable housing, that this is the best thing since sliced bread. It, it remains to be seen. Um, I think that uh, the mayor can be appealed to, and that's why it's so important for people to continue to apply pressure and to demonstrate and to write letters and to call the mayor. You just, you would be surprised at how effective phone calls to the office of a politician are. Because, you know, they figure that for every person who calls, there might be a hundred people out there who have this similar sentiment. So it really behooves people to contact your council member, to contact the, borough pres the Manhattan Borough President, and to contact Mayor Adams and to say, look, this may look like a good idea, but it's not a good idea for Harlem. It's not a good idea for working people. It's not a good idea for people who want to see um, not just historic Harlem preserved, but to see a Harlem which is welcoming to African-Americans to continue to exist. And uh, um, I would submit to you that every new tall building with less than 50% affordable housing that's built in Harlem uh, is a contributor to further gentrification and displacement. Absolutely. Um, you, you, you hit my question because I was going to ask. Oh, uh, I was going to say it goes, it, goes to the, it goes to the Manhattan Borough President and then it goes mm -hmm. to the Planning Commission mm -hmm. and then finally to the City Council. So all those places need to be um, contacted mm -hmm. for people to let um, the authorities know how they feel. Yeah, that was exactly what my next question was going to be. What, what can we, my audience, our audience do um, to address this? Um, is there anything else that you haven't mentioned that? Well, somebody, somebody needs to uh, um, um, come up with a moveon.org uh, petition. Mm -hmm. Those are persuasive mm -hmm. and easy to do in social media. And uh, um, and then, uh, as I say, people should telephone and email um, all of their elected officials, um, the mayor, especially the um, oh, and Ms. Adams, the um, speaker of the city council. She should be contacted as well because she plays a very important role. Um, the Planning Commissioner, um, which I don't think has been determined who that is yet. The, um, uh, but you know, you can still contact their office. And then um, the Manhattan Borough President should all be contacted, um, Mark Levin uh, and, and, and your local city council member. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was also gratifying, the new Harlem city council member um, gave testimony in opposition to this project. So mm -hmm. that was, cool. and uh, so uh, we have a fighting chance, mm -hmm. but not if we fail to act. You know, they have so much money, and for them 
so much is at stake. Millions and millions and millions. Tens of millions are at stake. And so they won't give up easily. But united, we have a fighting chance to be able to make things better. Absolutely. That's all the questions I have for you today, but I, um, I do um, hope to ha have you back as the process, uh, the approval process unfolds. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we close today? Well, um, I just like to say, you know, that I'm a preservationist. So the overarching thing that concerns me is the preservation of historic Black Harlem. And the past uh, 10 years, we've lost something like 20 historic Black churches in Harlem. And invariably, they've been replaced by um, luxury condos for um, people who don't live here. And uh, people really do need to participate in the community board and join Save Harlem Now and uh, speak out. Because um, in Greenwich Village, 80% um, of the buildings there are protected by landmarking. And in Harlem, it's the obverse. Uh, maybe 20% of our buildings are protected by landmarking and 80% are um, have no protection at all. Mm -hmm. And so we deserve reciprocity. We deserve the same kind of protection and to be taken seriously as an historic and architecturally significant place in the same way that Greenwich Village has been. And currently that's not the case. And I'm telling you, to be able to preserve all of those um, six story apartment buildings on Broadway or on Lenox Avenue or on 7th Avenue and to prevent them from being replaced by super tall luxury towers that will not only preserve an historic and important place but it will preserve more affordable housing than will ever be built in New York ever. Mm. That's exactly right. Thank you for saying that. Um, thank you for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and knowledge uh, with us. Um, again, I hope well, we hope to have you back as this process unfolds to check in to see what the latest update is. Um, and again, it's been an honor speaking with you and, and thank you for having, thank you for coming on the show. I was very happy to, thank you. Thank you.